11, Matthew chapter 11, been talking about how God is real, right? What we have is real. I don't know, it's near and dear to my heart, I think, partly because you, you think about... Um, there's just a lot of people that don't want to stand for truth. There's a lot of people that don't want to stand for what we believe in. Uh, don't say it's the wrong way, but you know, we'll broadcast our sports and we'll broadcast all this other stuff and we'll stand for all of these things. But when it comes to taking a stand for Christ, a lot of times we tuck tail or hide a little bit, if I could say it that way. And I don't know, I, I think sometimes that uh, we get concerned or we wonder how people are going to think or, or feel about us. And I, I guess what I'm trying to get across that God's laid in my heart, hopefully as we go through a few of these, is, is that we understand that what we have is real. It's okay to, to love the Lord. It's okay to know that your God is the only wise, true God. He is the living God. It's okay to stand for Jesus Christ. It's okay to mention the name of Jesus and to say, bless be God, or whatever you want to say out there in the world. We don't have to hide from the world. Truthfully, I think, if you ask me, I think it's sinful if we hide from the world because they need to see Christ in us, right? We are a reflection of God in the world. But I think that Christians probably... All of us, I'm just going to throw us all in a lump sum. We are Christians, and I'm not calling anybody out, so don't get offended. Don't be finicky with me tonight. I'm just saying I believe we're weaker Christians because I wonder if we doubt a little bit if what we have is real. Uh, I'll be honest, you know, sometimes with prayer requests, I'm, uh, I'm just going to be honest. I'm scared sometimes to ask God for certain things because if He doesn't answer it's not that I'm questioning God. I just wonder, how am I going to feel when this thing comes out? Was it because of my lack of faith or is it because I didn't believe? You understand what I'm saying? So we just got to be mindful of all of that and put all that together to say this. What we have is real. Matthew chapter 11, you find your place, please stand with me. We're going to read verses 2 through 6 this evening. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. We started it last week. Really, we're going to focus in on two verses this evening. It says, Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Father, I come before you this evening, Father, with a, really a heavy heart, but Lord, I just want to say tonight what you want me to say, Lord, not what I have to say, God. Truthfully, I, I know you're real. God, there's been times in my life I've, I've slacked at that and, and doubted in my actions, Lord, and, 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 and things that I do, Father, but I know you're real. I know my salvation is real. I know that Jesus Christ is real. I know this Bible of the Word of God, the King James Bible that you've given to us is real, Lord. All of those things. But God, sometimes we can get in those situations and circumstances and our, out, uh, our action shows that we don't believe what we have is real, Lord. I just ask you to help me tonight. Guide my voice, Lord, and just help to be said tonight what needs to be said according to your will and your way and not mine. Thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you for salvation. And Lord, I will say this. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God that leads us and guides us. And thank you that we can come together in a church tonight in a free country in a warm building, Father, to hear about you. So I pray that's exactly what happens is that we're drawn closer to you this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Appreciate you standing. You can be seated. Just catch us up real quick. Remember, John's in prison and he... Uh, sends two of his disciples, he hears that uh, Jesus is out preaching, and he sends two of his disciples to go and ask Jesus Christ a question. And uh, every time I read this, it, it's a uh, it's pretty intense question. Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? I want you to realize, John the Baptist, and I want to re-preach last week, but who said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the the sin of the world, the one that saw the dove descending upon him, which was the Holy Spirit of God. This is John the Baptist that has been preaching repentance. This is John the Baptist that was living in the wilderness. This is John the Baptist that Jesus said there's not one born greater of a woman than John the Baptist. This is John the Baptist that got himself put in prison because he stood upon the law, the word of God, the truth. And he tells him that, uh, hey, the wife you have is not lawful. 
And that's what locked him up. So when we, if we were to look at John the Baptist's life, before we get to the section here in Matthew chapter 11, we would say absolutely for sure in the actions of John, he believed in God. And I don't know if I said this last week, but I want to say it tonight. That ought to be said about us too. Right? People should, this term of Christians getting under my skin, but people ought to be able to look at you and say, yep, that's a child of God. They believe the Bible. They believe in the church that Christ established. They believe in the gospel. They believe in witnessing, right? People ought to be able to know that about us. I know it's an old cliche thing, but I've heard preachers say, if we ever got put in front of a jury, would we be found guilty for being a born-again believer for a Christian? And we got to wonder about those things in our own life, and that's a challenge in our own life, no doubt about it. But in John's walk with God, we would say, yep, John believed in God. There's no doubt about it. John believed in Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about it. But there's a situation and a circumstance that pops into John's life. And he begins to wonder. And he sends the two disciples. I told you last week, not sure if it was the disciples' purpose or for John the Baptist. Doesn't matter to me. All three of them got the same answer from Jesus Christ as they went up and said, Art thou him? I mean, they're basically saying, Are you really the Messiah? Art thou he? I'm sorry, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Thankful for his mercy and grace. I'm thankful for, uh, Lord, just his hand of mercy. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't get mad. But he just answers simply. He says, this is what I want you to do. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again these things which ye do hear and see. Here's another convicting point. <laughs> I shouldn't have. Uh, I, I laugh and joke about it. I probably shouldn't, but people plaster whatever they think all over their car, right? And, and people get Scripture tattooed on them. Or they get the shirt that says, John 3.16, boy, look at me, I'm a Christian, right? And, but it ought to be, what do they see and hear in us, right? Do, do they see Christ in us when we're going through a trial and tribu tri tribulation? Do they see joy? Do they see hope in us? Do they really see that we're settled with who we are in Christ Jesus. And can I say, you're not your own, right? You're bought with a price. When, when you got saved, God owns you who shed His blood for your salvation. You are His, right? You're a new creature. And that new creature ought to project Jesus Christ, period, right? It, it should prove that we believe that He is the great I Am. It should prove that we believe He is the, the Redeemer. It should prove that we believe He is the Son of God, right? I shouldn't have to tell somebody that I'm a Christian. I shouldn't have to tell somebody that I'm great, you know, lavishing in the Word of God. I shouldn't have to tell somebody or explain to them who I am. They ought to be able to see it in me. Like I said uh, last week, I'll say it again. I, I think I keep saying that a lot, huh? I know in the Marine Corps when people would show up and they would begin to gab about how much they knew, it only took a couple weeks to figure out they didn't know what they were talking about, right? I'm, I'm just being honest. You know, and, and when people show up and they say, well, blah, 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 I, maybe I'm a skeptic. I just step back and say, okay, let's give it some time and, and see if that really is who you are, right? And God, God, uh, people ought to see God in us, no doubt about it. They ought to say, yes, they absolutely believe what they have is real. There ought to be an evidence of that. There ought to be a walk that, that proves that we do believe again that He is the great I Am. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is Jesus Christ. Now Jesus was preaching and, and John's in prison. He's in a, a not a great circumstance. Really, he's on death row. He's got a lady that's uh, trying to kill him, Herodias, and she's trying to do everything she can to kill him. So I can completely understand uh, if he begins to look at that situation, circumstance can begin to wonder, and because we can. Lord, look at all the things that I'm doing. Why am I going through this? And, you know, there's a lot of times we can just say, I don't know. <laughs> and God's a sovereign God, and, and He's doing something out of it, and eventually He'll show that to us, but that some things we just don't have answers for as we go through them. And when we get down uh, or distant from God, we can begin to wonder if He's real. And Jesus tells him something here, tells the disciples to go back and let him know something really that just says, listen, how I want to evidence myself or prove it is watch the works. I shouldn't say prove it because it's Christ, but you go back and tell him what you have seen in me. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to shortcut, probably give you the conclusion and go through the points right here is when we begin to wonder if what we have is real, we've got to go back and think and remember everything that God's done in our life. We've got to think and remember everything 
that God has done in our life. And I'm not trying to be fruity up here, but we have life because of God. We have children because of God. We have uh, a work uh, place because of God. We have a home because of God. We have a, a vehicle because of God. Now, I'm not saying that God delivered the car in your uh, driveway, but God gave you the health and the cognizant way to think to be able to do those things, right? And God has many times given somebody a specific job that would assist them or specific finances at the right time and specific health, specific health at the right time. I've heard of people that would go in for like a cold, probably not a cold, but something else, and through their testing, they would find that they have something that's devastating, and had they not been there at time, would have died. And you can't tell me it's not God. It's not dumb luck, and it's not some genius doctor. It's God. You look around at this world, and I know it's goofy. Everybody talks about evolution and Big Bang. There's no way that this thing would be here if it were not for God. You with me? Every breath we have is because of God. Every heartbeat we have is because of God. But boy, we can get into circumstances in our life, and we begin to focus on those things, and we might forget who God is in our life. They witnessed these miracles that Jesus Christ did. Jesus specifically said, you go and show John Again, the things which you do hear, hear and see. And what did they hear and see? Verse 5 says, the blind receive their sight. <laughs> now, there's no way that they could doubt uh, if they saw a blind man come up. Jesus says, here's your sight. And he walked away with sight. They couldn't doubt that that wasn't the Messiah that provided him sight, right? You just get that picture in your head. Plenty of uh, recorded history that's in the Scripture where we read where Christ did that, right? Or the lame to walk. And I, I love how Jesus do it, right? Get up. Pick up your bed and get on down the road. And talking to people that have been lame for 30 years, right? There's no muscle. The bone joints don't work. None of that stuff uh, would work. And they get up because they're completely 100% healed. And they walk down the road. And Jesus does that in front of the disciples. He says, this blind man makes him see. And the, the lame man gets up and he begins to walk away. And lepers are cleansed and deaf can hear. And as if that's not enough, dead are raised up. And then he says in the end of that thing, I love it, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Three things we see. Number one is the miracles proved that Jesus is the Son of God. The miracles proved that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, turn with me real quick to John 20. Look over with me in John 20. And you know if you read your Bible and study it, the Jew seeks after the sign, right? But we knew that the Messiah was going to come. The Old Testament would give evidence on how they would know it was Him. And in John chapter 20, verse 30, 31, he says this. Now, this is after he had risen and Thomas, uh, um, he had risen from the grave and Thomas was talking to him and he tells him, hey, stick your finger here and, and be not faithless, but believing. And then in verse 30, this is what Jesus says. He says, and many other signs truly, did, I'm sorry, the Bible says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. I, 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 I was talking to somebody the other day about, you know, the Bible and... Uh, you always hear, well, it's man-made. <laughs> That's where I need, I need that meekness in my life. <laughs> so pray for me. But, I, you know, that, well, 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 man wrote that book. Well, man, did, what else did Jesus do? Or how do you prove this? I don't know. I can tell you this. At the end of the book of John, it says that if, if we'd have written books on everything that Jesus did, the world couldn't contain it. You know, number one. But here in 30, he says, And many other signs uh, in the presence of a disciple, which are not written in this book, but 31. But these are written that she may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So Jesus says, listen, I, I did these things to evidence who I am, specifically within context of the Scripture. He died, was buried, and rose again. Why? To provide for you everlasting life. The gift of everlasting life is for out there for anybody to claim if they will repent of their sin and trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, right? So God says, Jesus, I've recorded these things down that you may know that I am He. These have been written down and you have seen these to evidence that I am the Messiah. Why? That you may have life. And that's what he tells the disciples to go back and to tell John. And we don't think about it, maybe you don't, but I do, my strange mind. But John's in prison, and I can't imagine what's going through his head is, when is Herodias going to kill me? It's got to be in his mind. He knows that he's not getting out of there because she's upset. She wants him dead. And he's got to be sitting in prison thinking these things through his mind. I'm not saying he's, he's uh, overwhelmed or infatuated with them, but I know that they're in his mind as he's thinking this. And can you imagine the breath of fresh air when those disciples come back and say, don't worry about it, John. <laughs> he's the Messiah. 
There's no doubt about who you said the Son of God was. There's no doubt about uh, the great I am, the Redeemer. It's Him. We're good to go. Everything's been fine. Maybe that breath, breath, breath of fresh air came through John. He's like, all right, I know I'm out of here one day. When I die, I'm going on to heaven. But I know for sure that this is the Messiah. All I'm trying to say is they saw the miracles performed, and they went back to tell John, not a uh, credential thing, uh, not a background listing, none of those things. They just told John what he knew the Scripture said, that Jesus had to do these things to get evidence of himself. And John can say, well, right, I trust the written law. The exact same thing that put him in prison in the first place. He can say, yep, I know it's real. I know it's true. There's a huge debate in the world today. It has been for probably a couple hundred years on whether this book that we have is real. I'll tell you this, I've never heard anybody else stand up and say with a, any other scripture, say, I got the true word of God. I, I never, I don't go to those places, so maybe that's why I don't. But I can suppose that they wouldn't do that because there could be 15, 25 other different perversions in the service so that they wouldn't be able to say that, right? Now listen, I'm not saying I worship this Bible, but this is the preserved word of God, Right? And I can look at it and say, oh, this is what God did. That's real. Oh, this is what Jesus did. That's real. Hey, the, the, the Old Testament saints did these things. Why? To give me principles and, and examples for me to live in my life. I can say that's real. I can know for sure that if this thing tells me that if I follow God and, and live according to His Scripture, I can receive the blessings of God. This thing tells me that I know for sure I have a home in heaven, that Jesus is coming back. He's made a mansion for me. Right? All of these things that are in this Bible are real. And we, we say amen. And we should say amen, right? But do we live? That breaks my heart for me. Do we live as if this thing's real? God help us. We know it's real. We know it's real. But do we really know it's real? Those disciples didn't go back and say, hey, blah, blah, blah. Here's a list of things. They just went back and said, you know what? We saw Jesus Christ healed some deaf people. Jesus Christ healed some blind people. Jesus Christ cleansed some leopards. Some lepers, I'm sorry, not leopards. <laughs> Jesus Christ... <laughs> what, did, what did the deaf people and the blind people deserve to be healed? I mean, honestly. You, you, understand, you understand my point? They didn't, they didn't do anything to rate that. That was the grace of God. That was Jesus loving people. They showed up and Jesus healed them. Thank God they went to the right individual. I get it, but all of these things gave evidence and proof that he was in fact Jesus, the Son of God. And I recognize we can't go down to Jerusalem today and see Jesus healing people, but, but we can sure go back to Jerusalem and see Jesus healing people. And we can go back and see Jesus' earthly ministry and we can see the things that we have in the future, right? I'm just asking you tonight, do you really believe that the Bible is real? Not as a textbook, not because I was raised that way, not because that's what the church believes. Do you really believe that the Word of God is real? The two disciples go back, tell Jesus He's done some healing. These miracles were life-changing to the recipients, no doubt about it. Every possible disablement was healed right here, and disease was removed. And there are surely life-changing events that have happened to you, right? Right? Salvation would be the very first one that would have to occur for you to recognize and understand. But when salvation occurred, you realize your eternity was changed. When your salvation occurred, you realize that you're no longer going to hell. You cannot go to hell. When your salvation occurred, you realize you're now joint heirs with the Son. When your salvation occurred, your name was written down in the Lamb's book of life, right? When salvation occurred, you were stamped with that approval, the earnest, the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God now indwells you when you were saved. I'm just saying all of these miraculous things happened. You were adopted into the family of God. You were justified. You were purified, right? You were redeemed. You're paid for. There's no way out of it. You can't go away from it. Your faith is kept by the power of God. Those things change, boy, that's a miracle in and of itself because nobody under this room or anybody else can earn that salvation. God says, I love you and I provide it. Will you take it by faith? Absolute miracle that our eternity would change. 
Maybe you've been through a health situation. I can't say I've been through some awful health situations. I've had some things pop up that I realized there was nothing that I could do and there's nothing that a doctor can do. All I had to do was pray and ask God and say, okay, God, whatever your will is in this matter, help me to have the grace to receive that answer. And when you get through it, there's no doctor so-and-so, there's no pill so-and-so, there's nothing. All you can say at the end of that thing is, but God. But God. So why do we so quickly forget that what we have is real when the circumstance and the situation pops up? Will we see the principle here? Go back and remember what God has done for you. I don't care what situation you've ever went through in your life. You've probably been in one where the only way that you could get out of it is God. Now listen, I recognize that God uses people, okay? I know that. But maybe you've had a burden in your heart or something that you've been bearing that you don't want to share with anybody else, right? And when God answers that, but God. We're talking Tuesday night about prayer and Caden brought up George Mueller. I, I, I love reading his books and just the things that he does. He, he would want something done with the orphanage and he wouldn't tell nobody. He'd just walk on the streets in England and he'd pray and he'd pray and he'd pray and oh, here comes Billy and Billy'd come over and said, hey, God laid on my heart to give you 500 pounds. Bam, here you go. And that would be what's needed to pay for whatever was in that orphanage. And he'd, he'd have another need and he wouldn't tell nobody. He'd just tell God and he would walk the streets talking to God. Boy, <laughs> If we would just talk to God and believe God like George Mueller just walked and believed and trusted that God was going to provide it. There was no doubt in George Mueller's mind and heart that God was real. We've been through situations and we need to look back at those and say, yep, he was real at that moment. He's still real now. What we have is real. So the miracles in and of itself prove that Jesus Christ was Jesus. And those miracles would deal with every disablement that possibly could occur at that time, whether it was lameness, blindness, deafness, or even diseases that no other could take away. Jesus healed them. The second thing that he did, though, in verse 5 that you see there is he says, the dead are raised up. <laughs> the dead are raised up. Now, nobody has power over life but God. John chapter 10, verse 18 reads this way. You flip over if you want to. John chapter 10, verse 18. So the control of life or, or having control over life proved that Jesus was the Messiah, proved that He was in fact the Son of God. In John chapter 8, I'm sorry, 10, verse 18, the Bible says this. No man taketh it from me. He's talking about Jesus Christ. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus is saying, nobody can take my life. And listen, when I give my life, I'm going to take it back again. 100% absolute positive clarification that Jesus is... The Messiah. Jesus has power over life and He would resurrect those individuals. And I know that there were some people in the Old Testament that God gave the power to and we see resurrection and you read into the New Testament that God gave the power to the individual to raise that life again. And then we see Jesus Christ, if you look through His earthly ministry, where He would raise life again. And ultimately in the end He says, I'm going to take mine and I'm going to raise mine again. There's no arguing that Jesus is the Son of God. Again, remember, the disciples have come asking, are you Jesus? And Jesus says, I don't need to tell you about who great I am and all these wonderful things. You just watch and see what I do. And he would have a resurrection or a couple resurrections and the dead would come back to life and the disciples would look at that and say, yep, only God has that power. Only God controls life. Jesus has power over life, evidencing this being God in the flesh. No man has any power over life, no doctor, no healer, no nobody, just God. Now, I'm not saying that God can't give life again today. I'm not saying that God can't heal today. I'm not saying that God, we can certainly pray and ask God to move in an area of an individual's life to provide for them their life. I'm not saying a resurrection from life. I'm talking about a disease. Jesus did come to give His life and to give it more abundantly. So often we allow the circumstances to weigh our life down or control it. And when we need to yield to His control, 
I know we tell people this all the time, maybe even our children or friends, that listen, I, I, I promise you, whoever you're talking to, there's no greater life and joy than knowing and serving Jesus Christ. We say it, but do we believe it? Are we willing, honestly, are we willing to say, if you think about resurrecting a life, okay, I was just telling the deaf over there, every individual in here has a little spirit in them and a big spirit if you're saved, right? You have the Holy Spirit of God and you have your own spirit. And what God's trying to beat into us, he doesn't beat it into us, what the Word of God tries to tell us is that, listen, if you'll yield to the Holy Spirit of God and not the spirit of self, then you can have the abundant life, right? Right? And, and there is a resurrection that occurs in that because what does he say? I'm to be crucified to the flesh, right? I'm to be dead to the flesh. I'm to be dead to the spirit things that I want, my own will and my own way and my own desires. We want our heart's desires to line up with God. But if we'll die to the little spirit, die to self, God will give us an abundant life. But we'll never experience it if we don't believe he's real. I'll tell you this, you'll never experience it if you don't think that it's real enough to say, this is not worthy of my cause, but that is. You'll never experience the abundant life. You'll miss out on it. Those disciples came to Christ and said, are you the Messiah? He says, I am. You, you watch and see these things that I do, and you go back and let them know, and he would perform miracles, and providing uh, freedom from diseases and freedom from any disablements. He would give that back to them. And he'd say, listen, watch this. I'm going to resurrect some individuals to life. All of those laying claim that Jesus Christ, in fact, is the Messiah. And you say, what's that got to do with me? Well, he has control over your health and finances and everything else in your life. And truthfully, if you'll uh, crucify to yourself the flesh and put that down and be willing to live what God would have you to live for, following the Holy Spirit of God, you can have the abundant life. The abundant life. But if we're honest, we don't want the abundant life. We want our own life. We want what we want. We're not willing to crucify that flesh and lay it down to fulfill His will and His way. And I'll tell you this. I feel like people go one way or the other when they get into a rut. I really do. People, when they get into a rut, there's no middle ground. They'll get into a rut, and what happens is they walk away from God i got a great friend of mine. I'm not going to pronounce it and say his name. But I remember when a situation popped up in his life. I'm talking about an individual that would never, ever be away from the church. Ever. He would constantly serve. He would give. He was in every service. He was visited everywhere. And his life proclaimed Christ. He went through a situation in his life. And he'd skipped two, three weeks. He didn't want to be in the church. He didn't want to be around anybody. He didn't want to do the things that he had done his entire life. Why is that? Because of what hit him, pulled him away, or made him doubt what he had was real. When we ought to be here and here and on our knees whether it's at home or wherever, I'm not saying the altar, but we ought to be begging and crying out to God because we know what we have is real. Miracles prove that Jesus is in fact Jesus Christ and everything He took away. The second thing we see is that Jesus had control over life. But I love how He ends it. I, if I'm writing the book, right, the gospel's probably going to be in the beginning because to me that's preaching. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but the gospel message changes the eternity of people. I, I get that. And, and we do recognize that over time if an individual gets saved, right? We, we, we would all say that. We would watch their life and see if there was uh, fruits of the Spirit, fruits of, uh, of repentance and fruits of uh, truthfully believing. There ought to be a change in their life that gives evidence of that, right? There should be a love for God that we'd see over time. All I'm trying to say is when we preach and somebody gets saved, we want to believe in our heart that something happen in them, but it's going to take a little bit of time to evidence if that was just a prayer or, or if they truly possess Christ, right? And I'm not questioning anybody's salvation, but if, if somebody can pray a prayer and go back out and live in the complete entire world and have no conviction of it, then I'm sorry, according to Scripture, not according to Dean Francini, there is no possession of Jesus Christ, right? When a corn babe pops out, it's screaming for milk. 
Nobody trains that thing that needs milk, right? When I'm born again, there's something in me. I might not know everything about it in Scripture, but there's something in me that wants me to be close to God. Something wants me to be in the Word of God and around the people of God and the place of God. Something inside of me is crying out. And even though I might not understand it, buddy, I'm under some serious conviction. It's not fun to do those things anymore, right? If you've experienced salvation, you know what I'm talking about. But there are people that pray a prayer and they go right back out and they don't feel bad about the things that they do. And you got to wonder. Well, I mean, you put it under Scripture, you got to say. <laughs> you have a profession and not a possession, Okay. But I'm just saying, if I wrote it, I'd have put the gospel first. (laughs) Yeah, Jesus preached. And then Jesus performed some miracles. I mean, cleansed some lepers and made some deaf people see, see, hear, and some blind people see. And and if that's not enough, there were some dead people. I'm talking dead, dead, D-E-D, dead. And God raised them up from life. I'm just, but he flips this thing. I was talking to a brother yesterday, and words have power, words have meaning. You know, and, you, and when I look at this, I think, good night of living. The miracles, the raising of the dead, then he says, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. <laughs> Aren't you glad that somebody told you about Jesus Christ? Amen. I mean, I'm being serious. Aren't you, aren't you glad that somebody... I mean, that's, there's nothing... It's not what the world wants to do. That's no kudos to self. I know people get in the wrong attitude, the wrong spirit on why they soul win, but I'm just saying there's no self-gain. Do you, you realize that? There's zero self-gain for somebody to knock on your door and tell you about Jesus Christ. There's zero self-gain for somebody to, to give you a track. Zero for self. It's all for the glory of God, every bit of it. Salvation in and of itself is no, no gain. God, God gave it all so that we could have salvation. You, you understand what I'm saying? And that's why I believe he, he ends with this thing and says, listen, listen, yeah, he did some healing and yeah, he raised some people from the dead, but man alive, he was the gospel. He was saying the kingdom, of, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. He was saying, listen, you believe in me and, and you're saved and you can have life. If you don't believe in me, you'll die in your sins. Jesus Christ is preaching the message of his death, burial, and resurrection. Then the disciples get this last as they go back to John. Now, John's a preacher, so maybe it made a little bit better. Maybe he felt a little bit better about it to himself as he's thinking, all right, I am preaching truth. But I wonder if that went through his mind. Like, listen, we've been talking about a repentance and this belief in Jesus Christ. And boy, we were all in and we believed it. And now he's preaching a thing. And, and now it's back. And Jesus says, this is evidence that I am the Messiah. Amen. The gospel is being preached. Can I say this? We're going to go to John right here in a minute and close this thing up in a second. But is there any more evidence that God is real in your life than you telling somebody else? Do you, I'm just, come on, work with me. Do you know how much of a fool you look like when you go and tell somebody, well, there's this guy that came 2,000 years ago, and he died on the cross at Calvary, and he was buried, and he rose up again the third day. And, and listen, what I want you to understand is that his blood takes away your sins. Okay? And you can't see him. You're not going to get a letter. You're not going to hear anything from it. But you just got to, by faith, trust in this thing. Okay? And you can have a home in heaven. Sure. Am I getting some oceanfront property down there in Ohio too? I, I mean, right? Work with me. But when that drive is in you for you to go and do that, there's, I don't think there's any more, i got to be careful how I say this, I don't think there's any more evidence that God's real. Yeah, He saved me. Yeah, maybe He healed me. Yeah, maybe He provided for me. And that's between me and God I can do that thing. But when I go out to a lost world and say, listen, I just want you, I don't know you from Adam. Matter of fact, you've probably done something wrong. Maybe you voted the wrong way, right? Because we're all polit- political. Maybe you've done something I don't like. But listen, what I want you to understand is that if you die, I want you to go to heaven with me. I don't know you from Adam, but God loves you, and he died for you just as much as he died for me. I'm telling you, there's no more real, or there's no more that God is real in your life than when you tell somebody about Jesus Christ. And he ends a thing. I look at all these wonderful miracles that I have, but the disciples could go back and say, he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the gospel. John 17, look there with me real quick. John 17. John 17. John 
John chapter 7, verse 1 through 4. If you know this, everybody says this is the last prayer that Jesus Christ prayed. We were in it, but these words spake Jesus, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus is on his way to his cross, right? And he's saying, all right, Lord, Father, God, I'm coming to the end of this thing. My work's been fixing to soon be over. I'm going to take the whole weight, the whole sin of the entire world upon me. I'm going to take that thing to the grave, and I'm going to rise up on the third day. And Jesus, who knew no sin, was going to take all of that upon him, and he's saying, look, Father, the time for you to be glorified is now. As I'm going to my death, burial, and resurrection, why is that? So that the entire world can have an opportunity to have a home in heaven. That's the message that those two disciples would take back to John. Jesus was preaching about his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus was preaching about this grace gift of salvation. Jesus was preaching about he's the only way to heaven. Jesus was providing a way for a sinner to be made whole, for a dead man walking to have an abundant life in Christ Jesus. I wonder in my mind, is John sitting in that jail cell waiting for Herodias to come and whack his head off, thinking, man, is this the Messiah? It's got to be the Messiah. It's got to be. Waiting for the disciples to come back. And then the disciples show up. Yep, Jesus, Jesus healed some people. And he probably thinking in his mind, all right, it's what the words, it's what the law said. The word of God, we know it's the Messiah by the healing. And okay, what else did he do? And they, well, he, he did some resurrections and he raised some people from the dead. And he'd be like, okay, yep, I, I, yep, lines up with the law, lines up with everything. And, and, and what else did he do? <laughs> they said he, he preached the gospel. He'd go to poor, dirty, rotten scoundrels and tell them there's a way to heaven. He'd go to them and say, I died for you. I gave my life for you. I wonder which one of those three, we'll know one day we get to talk to John the Baptist, but I wonder which one of those three really excited him. I want to just presume in my mind it was the gospel. It was the gospel. Jesus said, you'll see and hear. I think we live a life that's just too succumb to the stinking world and sinfulness. And we have all power at our hand. We have every blessing that God could ever want to give us at our hand. And we allow the world and we allow Satan and we allow ourselves to put us in this place over here. And we might not say it out loud. Are you really God? Was that really the Messiah? We might not say it out loud. But our actions portray that. Because we've allowed the world to get us to this place. You say, well, how do we get out of that? How do we move away from that? We look back and say, well, I remember when I was 29 years old. And I rejected Christ for 29 years. I had nothing to do with Him. I knew all about the gospel. But that morning I was sitting in that double wide trailer in North Carolina reading my Bible. And God said, hey, you need to be saved, son. But God... I know all this stuff. I know the Word of God and the penetrating power of the Holy Spirit of God kept hitting me and said, no, no, no. You need to believe and trust in Jesus Christ. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ that morning. And I just got to look back and say, yep, Jesus was real then. He's real when I'm 48. He's real when I was 29 and He's real today. And then I got to look back and say, okay, God, there were times and situations in my wife's life and my kids' life and my life and I just begging you, God, I didn't know how it was going to turn out. And you answered my prayer, and you gave them what was needed. And yep, God's real. He's absolutely real. I know we can't say anybody was resurrected, but you could surely say people were resurrected that you've been praying for years that they'd be saved, and God saved them. So how do I get through those? Just the same way he told the disciples in John. Those things you see and hear. Stay in the Word of God. Remember what God's done in your life. 
It is absolutely real what we have. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a fantasy. This is not some condu- uh, con- whatever made up stinking religion. It's none of that. We know God is real. We know the Word of God is real. We know that Jesus is real. Now, can the world figure that out by looking at us? What do they see and what do they hear in us? God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for salvation, Lord. You're nothing greater or better than that. Nothing at all. I'm thankful that you died on the cross of Calvary. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful that you made it known that you died on the cross of Calvary, Lord, that it wasn't unknown or it wasn't unattainable, Lord. You've, you've made it known through the preaching of your word, God. You've preserved your word, Lord, one of the greatest things that are under attack in the world today, Lord, but you've preserved it. Why? Because you're God. <laughs> you're God, and we can trust that that Bible is absolutely real, God. I pray you'd help me in my life and in the areas and situations I struggle in my life, God, that I'd go back and say, yep, it's in the Bible, I know it's real. And Lord, if I ever get to the place where I'm too far out, Lord, that I look back and say, well, you saved me so I know you're real. And and I remember the things you've done in my life so I I know you're real, God. I'm definitely not going to start living a doubtful life now, God. May I live under the powerful hand of God and, and move forward, Lord, with my life, proclaiming to the world that what I have is real. I don't have to be embarrassed, God, help us. We don't have to be scared, God, help us. You, you say you haven't given us a spirit of, of fear, but of a sound mind, Lord. So I, I pray, God, that you would help us truthfully live a life that evidences to the world that you're real. Help us, God. Whatever's in our way, Lord, we'd put it out. May we be reminded of God. <laughs> May we, may we be reminded of what you have, what you've given, and what you will give to us, Lord. May we just be revived in our hearts to get back to Scripture or reminded of who we are in you, ambassadors for Christ. But Lord, I beg you, Father, that we'd all be challenged in an area of our life to say, yep, I know for sure God is real. And I'm going to go to God and I'm going to proclaim what I need so that I can show the world that you're real. I beg you, Father, for your help. I do. Lord, I pray that we just take a little bit of time, Father, tonight. I just feel like maybe we should just talk to you, God. And I just ask you to bless that. Move in our heart and our life, God. Move our spirits that we'd be drawn close to you. Father, just give us the, uh, the encouragement, Lord, and the, the power that we need to live a life that's honored and pleasing to you, God. So I just pray that you bless, bless this little bit of quiet time. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.